Good morning uh, to uh, Stanford University in that case. Um, we have nine hours difference uh, to Europe and it's great that you got up uh, so early uh, today for us. So thank you very much in advance. And um, now it's, it's interesting because um, Dan Klein, you are um, a lecturer at Stanford University uh, and uh, you teach in, in various departments and other universities, um, amongst others, the, the business school and the theater department. Yes. Uh, how, does, how do you connect um, these different departments? So what do you do to, to teach in these various universities? Well, I'll tell you, you know, I, when I started at Stanford, I started teaching at Stanford 15 years ago in the theater department. I, I taught improvisational theater, teaching people how to get up on stage and, and make up stories collaboratively in front of an audience. Um, but somewhere along the way, there were some uh, opportunities and challenges. The budget is always uh, in flux at, uh, in, the, in the university. And at one point, they said, you know, Dan, we're going to need to cut your classes down to, um, uh, to just one class. This was a number of years ago during the Great Recession. And, uh, and so as an improviser, I thought, well, I need to get creative and, and see uh, what, other, what other ways could I keep doing what I love to do. And, um, and I thought, who, will be, who is served by my improv classes? I get a lot of acting students, but I get many more students from other parts of the university. And one of the places I used to get a lot of students was from the business school. And so there turned out there was an opportunity to help serve those students in the business school by offering, uh, by offering classes uh, to them. So I was able to go specifically to the business school. I went to the, to the D school that teaches design thinking. And I, uh, and I was able to offer classes to them. And, and, uh, and since that moment, I've kind of turned my my appointment at Stanford to one where I've, I've taught in all seven schools in the university. I've taught in the uh, law school and medical school and engineering and education and earth sciences. So it's really, um, I was saying to Lucas right before, improv is a, it's an amazing field. It's a, it's a great chameleon. It applies to absolutely every single topic. The first class that I started teaching at the business school was actually one on status dynamics, which is a great Keith Johnstone concept of internet, interpersonal dynamics about power and connection. And the class that we teach there is called Acting with Power. Um, and it, it really is, a, it's about the social science of uh, hierarchical organizations, but it's not just uh, theoretical, it's an opportunity to also practice the tools of how do I signal authority and warmth at the same time? How do I how do I give how do I have credibility without um, without sacrificing empathy, and that's a class where we put people um, uh, we literally put them in scenes and 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 have professional directors uh, direct them and and let them not just learn about the concepts but actually apply them, and I'm really excited. Uh, tomorrow we're going to try an online version of the class in preparation for you know the class is normally offered in the spring, and uh, it's, it's easy to imagine that in the spring, it may not look like it has looked in the past, uh, in the past 10 years. And so we're doing, we're doing a little bit of advanced planning to figure out how, to, how can we do this class in an online setting. Now, it's interesting that uh, you, you, you taught at the theater department. And normally, you think like, well, improv acting at the theater department, so that is the place. Yeah. Now, how comes that the business department at Stanford asks you to do um, uh, improv acting because they're not actors? Uh, well, yeah. they so, I guess. Well, in some ways, you know, we're, we're all actors. I mean, Kat Coppett mentioned this yesterday in her, in her interview. We're improvising all the time. We're acting all the time. I mean, in many ways, it's not that we're being fake. It's that we are, we are, we have roles. We are, we have certain um uh there are th certain things that are expected of us in different positions and once we once we acknowledge that then we can be even more effective if if you have a position of of power or authority and but you habitually 
um, lower your status. You say, hey, would it be okay if, um, could everybody gather in right now? You don't, you're not sort of playing your role. It doesn't mean that, um, that's not, it's not, it doesn't mean that your personality doesn't have authority. It just means that you've got a habitual way of acting, of, of, of presenting yourself. And so when we learn the tools that we learn on stage in the, in the improv theater, when we learn those tools and we apply them in, in uh, organizational settings, we become more effective. It's not, it's not about being inauthentic, it, far from it. It's about expanding the range at which you can show up authentically. Sometimes we need to have power and authority in order to serve the greater good. Sometimes we need to let go of our power and authority in order to serve the relationship. And, and our ability to do that flexibly and fluidly, that's essentially improv training. Now, that's the first, that was the first class that I, that I started teaching over at the business school. But actually, over the years, they've really been embracing improv as a fundamental skill. Um, so another class that I teach is called Generative Leadership. And generative leadership is essentially a class on the improviser's mindset and design thinking. Uh, design thinking is essentially uh, a creative problem solving uh, technique that uses um, uh, radical collaboration and user-centered design. And the skills needed for design thinking to be able to solve problems for users are essentially the skills that we train as improvisers how to listen, how to pay attention, how to put yourself in someone else's shoes, how to fail cheerfully and, and use it as, a, as experimentation to try things out and learn and discover as you go. So that, that's a class I've been teaching for about seven years there, which is really quite exciting. And th at the very end of that class, we also use, um, it's also a class on uh, high performance communication. How do you share your ideas in a way that's most effective and impactful. It's really interesting. Sometimes people go, well, the key is to come up with a great idea. I mean, the idea should sell itself. But we know that that's not true. There, there are so many great ideas that, that die on the vine because they don't get, they, they're not championed in the, in the most effective way. So how do you communicate your ideas so that you can, so that they're most likely to be received and again, this is something that improvisers train to do. We're, we're trained to read the audience during the show and make decisions based on what's working and what's not working and where does the audience want it to go. And these are some of the skills that we also use, of course, in the business school. There's one other, there's one other sort of subset of, uh, of the improvisational skills that, are, that we use in the business school, and that is, um, uh, being able to present improvisationally. There's no doubt that a planned, a planned presentation is, um, is ideal, but not so rigidly planned that you don't have room to adapt and adjust, to, to respond to the audience in the moment, to respond to the needs uh, uh, in, the, in the room on that day. So we use a lot of, of the tools of the imp improvisational actor and, and add that into the skills of, uh, of presenting an idea, even if it's an already canned, pre-planned idea. Now you also mentioned uh, shortly uh, the mindset. So, yeah. so what, what is uh, the mindset of improvisation from your point of view that may be applicable for even um, other people who are not uh, in the arts? I think, uh, so, uh, I really like it when we boil the, the improviser's mindset down into three things. Um, there's a number of different sets of three things that, that work very well, but for my purposes, I think of it as um, uh, it's accept all offers. So we, we have to train ourselves to be open. We, we habitually reject or block offers and ideas. We do it to stay safe. We do it to stay in control. The improviser learns to accept all offers as a stance. That's our, our habit. Uh, and, um, and then the next piece is to know that everything is an offer. 
So there's a broader opening. It's not just things that are like, hey, here's an offer. Okay, good, I'll accept that. It's to recognize that everything in the world is potentially an offer. So we open our awareness. We open our, our um, uh, we, we tune our senses to be able to pick up on other stuff around the world. And then the last piece is that um, uh, especially mistakes. Mistakes are, are, are the uh, maybe the most fundamental type of offer that an improviser learns to accept. And that comes in a lot of different ways. It might be just a, a, tiny, little, uh, a tiny little error. They go, oh, well, that's interesting. I can use that. Or it may be a profound fundamental failure or disaster that we look at in a new way. Say, actually, what's great about this? Why is this something that we can use uh, to even better effect than we had ever imagined? And that's hard. It can be very hard. Uh, improv is a really fun place to train that skill because the stakes can be, you know, this, I think the stakes of performing improv are sort of ideal for practice because it's terrifying. There's no doubt. Like being on stage in front of a live audience and not knowing what you're going to say or what you're supposed to say is a fundamental human fear. But it's not... Um, your life is not in danger. There's no physical risk. It's not like um, it's not like climbing up the side of a mountain in a snowstorm. You are not in actual physical danger. And so, when we get to practice it, we get uh, we get all of the charge and energy and and um, uh, and pressure that comes from being in front of an audience without the physical risk and danger of. Uh, uh, um, which means that I can do a lot more, I can do dangerous things in a classroom without having to have insurance, liability insurance. Now you also um, sometimes um, talk about a play at work. Yeah. And this is very interesting because normally we distinguish between here's work and yeah. here's play. And um, now how to play at work? Yeah, I. Uh, this is something that I've been uh, that I've been exploring m my entire career. Um, one of the things I know in the improv classroom, I know that um, it works better. I can I'm, I can teach more effectively if people are having fun. If there's if there if it, there's a playful attitude, it's not just um, it's not just random fun. It, it has to be it, it's productive fun. But the value is. Um, uh, it is profound. If people are just working and banging their head against the wall, we, we can get somewhere, but not, but not in a, in a sustained, not for a sustained length of time. To really get things done, we have to be able to be playful. And the session I'm going to do right after this interview, I want to explore some of those ideas. Like what, what is it about play that's so appealing, that's so attractive? Why is it why is it something that we are drawn to? And why is it something that we avoid? Why is it something that we are repelled uh, in a sense from, especially because, you know, we used to play all the time. As kids, we play all the time. We have a, there's a sleeping uh, play master on this, uh, on this uh, video call right now, um, who uh, if, if they were awake, they could show, give us a master class in how to, in how to play. We were all good at this when we were kids. And, and somehow, somehow we sort of, uh, we squashed that. But, but play is the source. It's, it's how we engage. It's how we learn. It's how we grow. But it's also how we come up with new ideas. It's how we, um, it's how we break out of the rut. It's how we see things in, from a different angle. Play is life. That's all. That's all I'll say. And we'll explore it more in the, in the session afterwards. Now I'm very curious. <laughs> um, what you also sometimes say is that connecting is uh, such a, a, an important uh, aspect of improvisation. Now you, um, you had a TED talk and uh, there are many people all over the world who uh, watched the TED talk and you talked about connection. Why is yeah. connection uh, such an important aspect in your improvisation? Um, 
sometimes I would do a workshop uh, about connection. And I'll start by saying, you know, in order to do great work, we have to form bonds with each other. We must, we must form the connections. We know this from the teams that we've been on, that there's some version of, of a bond when we, when, and when we have that, sometimes we can form those bonds very rapidly. Sometimes it takes a long time to develop them. There are different, there are different reasons uh, why we bond at, at different paces with different individuals. But in order to do great work, we do need to have some form of a, of a, of a genuine connection based on empathy and trust. Um, but at the end of the workshop, I, I flip it around and I, I actually believe this is true. I, I think that it's, it's not, it's not that in order to do great work, we have to form bonds. I think that the reason that we want to do great work is so that we can form the bonds. We are a social species. I, I tried to look, I, I tried to uh, survey the, the research literature about, um, about quality of life and human connection. And I wanted to see if there was a, if there was a relationship between um, between you know people's satisfaction with their lives and how and how good the connections were with other people, I couldn't I couldn't uh, I couldn't tease it out because it's actually the measure that every study has for quality of life is how good are the connections that people have between people. It's a little bit of a of a uh, tautology. It's sort of like saying, well, that is the measure of a good life is how is how good are our connections when when people when when, when people are at the end of their lives and at the end of their careers, the things that they are remembered for are the connections that they have with each other. Uh, that's the that's the essence of it. I mean, that it's something that I've that I felt innately. But the more the more I practice, the more I the more I teach, the more I share, the more I recognize that that's that's what we all we all crave and fear connection. And the fact that I get to do improvisational workshops in non-theater settings just means that I get to give people more tools to find those connections with each other even faster. Now, you said you're teaching at various universities, uh, for example, in Stanford, but also at the Singularity University. Yes. And what, what is, what is that uh, what what kind of university is that yeah singularity is fascinating it's not an accredited university it, the, it, they, it uses the word university to indicate that it's a, a collection of, of uh, classes and and uh, experiential learning opportunities singularity university um teaches has anyone by the way anyone who i can see have you heard of singularity you can just raise a hand like this if you've heard of it uh no one two um so singularity uh does a lot of executive education about the future the the, the fact is um uh technology in particular is accelerating at a pace we have never seen before it's getting faster and faster it's it's accelerating exponentially and that means that our technological capacities are increasing exponentially in a way that's um, it's really hard to predict uh, and it's not just uh, it's not just computers but um, uh, it's anything that that uh, that uh, uh, digitization can touch so it might be uh, digital biology and 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 genetics it might be artificial intelligence maybe virtual reality all of these things happening at the same time mean that a leader, <laughs> needs to be aware of all the possibilities in all these domains and needs to be able to think exponentially. So what we do is we bring leaders together and we give them, in a sense, a crash course of the current state of the world in all these different technologies. I personally am not a technologist. And so what I get to do is share essentially improvisational uh, uh, thinking at the beginning of a session. It, it turns out that the the two skills that we need now more than ever uh, and that we're not teaching in our schools are um, agility and imagination. And that's what improv teaches, agility and imagination. We, be, we need to be able to change course and respond to the current conditions in this whiplash pace of change. And we need to be able to imagine the future. We have to be able to imagine it collaboratively. It's okay to be someone who sits and thinks up something on your own, but to come up with it together with groups and teams is the, is the actual, uh, that's the superpower. That's what we need to be able to do. And so that's the, that's the, 
Uh, that's what I get to provide with at Singularity University. And then every time we run a program, I get to be updated on what's the current state of, uh, uh, of, of technology. It's mind blowing. It's, uh, I mean, as Kat mentioned yesterday, imagine if we'd had this global pandemic just a few years ago and we and we didn't have just this simple zoom technology to be able to have uh you know live synchronous uh experiences like this imagine what it's going to be like in 10 years so regarding imagination in the next years i know we have no clue what will happen in the future yeah. but what would you say um regarding improvisation do we need it more? Do we need less? Do we need a different thing? What do you think? What is the trend yeah. after having three decades uh, of teaching improvisation? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm totally aware that I'm biased. Um, I would say we need it more, absolutely. I find that there's a, uh, when I first started teaching improvisation in organizations, um, uh, actually, I, I first started with Kat. She was my, my, uh, my first uh, mentor. She brought me in to teach with, uh, with one of her early clients, Kaiser Permanente. And it was really remarkable. I had started in, in the theater as a performer, and I thought, oh, we can use this to, uh, to help doc doctors work with their patients. Um, early, early on, um, most of the time when we would work with organizations, we we didn't say we're doing improvisation or we're doing theater or performance. We weren't, we really sometimes weren't even, uh, we didn't even really use the word game. We would say we're going to do an interactive simulation <laughs> or, uh, or, you know, there was some, like we had to change the language about what we were doing in recent years. We don't have to hide it anymore that we're doing improv. It's the thing that is sought out. There's a, there's been a fundamental shift in how people approach um, what the um, what they want and and need, this is my this is my sense of it. Over the years, um, the first the first generation of improvisers were people who wanted to be performers. The second generation of improvisers were people who realized that this was part of their uh, personal development. They were teachers or lawyers or or doctors. Uh, professionals, managers who realized they wanted they wanted to be able to think on the spot more. They wanted to be more alive and dynamic, or even more playful in their work, more more creative like they were when they were kids. We're in the third generation right now, and I know uh, Paul Jackson can attest to this. It's now organizations say we need improv as a core capacity for our teams for our for our groups it's not just for individuals and personal development we need we need organizations that have this the ability to adapt and 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 come up with creative solutions that meet the needs of our users in the moment and under pressure and so i think that's that's only going to keep going that 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 need isn't going to it's not like we're going to go oh we got that now we're going to have to go back to studying rote uh, uh, rote knowledge no, it's going to get more and more dynamic.